Welcome to the major regions of Egypt. <laughs> Life in ancient Egypt was concentrated along the shores of the Nile and divided into two regions. Lower Egypt was situated on the Nile Delta near the Mediterranean, and Upper Egypt was at the south reaching into Africa. Due to its proximity to the Mediterranean, temperatures in Lower Egypt were less extreme than in Upper Egypt. Until 3100 BCE and the unification of Egypt, each region had its own pharaoh and crown. Lower Egypt's crown was red and marked with symbols of papyrus and bees. Upper Egypt's crown was white with symbols of lotus and sedge grass. Both regions had competing major cities, most notably Memphis in Lower Egypt and Thebes in Upper Egypt. There were different religious cults in both regions, each worshipping their own major gods. Many of the temples were designed in such a way as to represent the two regions, and ceremonies often incorporated Upper and Lower Egypt in their rituals. Welcome to Bringer of Life, the River Nile. The ancient Egyptians called the dark fertile soil of the Nile the Black Lands, and the surrounding desert was referred to as the Red Lands. The dramatic difference of productive land opposed to barren desert had a deep influence on cultural ideology, mythology, and religion. The Nile determined much of Egyptian civilization. For example, the seasonal cycle of the Nile was so consistent that ancient Egyptians created their calendar around it. The flood season, or Akhet, was when the departing floodwaters left arable soil for crops. It was followed by the growing and harvesting seasons, known as Peret and Shemu. These regular seasons, along with abundant wildlife and rich soil, meant that Egypt's denizens were able to nourish themselves and ensure their country's strength in trade. The River Nile, flowing from the south to the north, neatly traversed through both Upper and Lower Egypt. All of Egypt's major cities were built along this narrow ribbon of life. Protected by mountain ranges and deserts which acted as natural barriers to enemies, and sustained by the Nile's plants and wildlife, Egyptian civilization enjoyed economic and cultural prosperity 
for over 4,000 years. Both ancient Egyptians and ancient Greeks referred to the Nile as the river in their respective languages. Stretching a distance of over 6,700 kilometers, the Nile is one of the longest rivers in the world. It flows south to north, spanning 11 countries. The River Nile originates in the region of the great sub-equatorial lakes, including one of the largest in the world, Lake Victoria near Tanzania. The river flows through African equatorial forests, swamps, volcanic lands, steppes, and deserts, splitting apart for a while and picking up various sediments from each region and carrying them all the way to Egypt. Its main artery, known as the White Nile, rejoins with the Blue Nile in Khartoum. This is where it weaves through rich deposits of silt and nutrients, carrying them along in its wake. The Nile crosses six cataracts from the south to the north, creating natural obstacles between the various sections of the river. The cataracts are long zones of about 100 kilometers where the bubbling and rapidly swirling waters advance tumultuously amid enormous heaps of rocks and benches of hard stone. It is after crossing Nubia and the first cataract that the river officially returns to Egypt in Aswan. There are still a thousand kilometers before it reaches Cairo and the Delta, bringing life to those living on its shores before it eventually empties into the Mediterranean Sea. Ancient Egyptian irrigation and water use was centered around the Nile. However, they also had access to streams and rivers, as well as several large lakes. The Delta, situated at the north end of the Nile, also known as Lower Egypt, is a large irrigated area where the river splits into several tributaries.
The delta had several major brackish coastal lakes, bodies of water separated from the sea by thin strips of land. A mix of deep to shallow waters, salt swamps and sand plains, these lakes were refuge to a wealth of species, as well as water and land plants. The occasional bandit could also be found sheltering within the denser reeds, waiting for the unwary traveler. Welcome to Deserts of Egypt. <laughs> Reaching out on either side of the lush Nile are the harsh arid western desert and the mountainous eastern desert. They cover nearly 94% of Egypt. Each of these parent deserts have their own microclimate and contain several smaller deserts with a distinctive fauna and flora. Whale fossils were discovered within the depths of the Sahara. Known as the Valley of the Whales, this location is evidence of the seas which once covered the area. Whoa. The White Desert in the northeast of the Sahara owes its name to its white limestone soil, contrasting with the yellow sand. The wind has eroded the rocks of the White Desert into stone mushrooms, the most famous of which is referred to as the Finger of God. Whoa. The Great Sand Sea is a large unbroken desert that reaches out through western Egypt and eastern Libya. It is home to a unique geological formation known as Libyan silica glass, the pale yellowish-green material ranges from pebble-sized fragments to glass rocks the size of rough boulders. Welcome to the Katara Depression. The Katara Depression is located in the northwest part of Egypt. Reaching 18,000 square kilometers, the basin is 133 meters below sea level and covered with salt. It is the second lowest point in Africa. The climate is very arid, with average temperatures reaching 36 degrees Celsius. The famous Siwa oasis is located on the protected southwestern region. Today, the Katara Depression is utilized for oil exploration. Welcome to Siwa. The Siwa Oasis is in the western desert of Egypt. Geographically, the Siwa Oasis is located in a depression 20 meters below sea level. Its natural springs and warm climate aided in the bountiful production of date trees. Though clearly influenced to some degree by Egyptian and African culture, the area's isolation resulted in a unique society and language. While they worshipped the same deities, Siwan temple architecture differed from traditional Egyptian temples. Old Kingdom Egyptians referred to the oasis as cauldron, 
due to its unique geographical structure. Oases were crucial for nomadic tribes and caravans. Without them, there was no chance of survival in an otherwise harsh landscape. As such, oases quickly became hubs for trade, as well as areas of political control. Whoa. Because of the dry climate, there is very little rainfall to sustain the oases. Instead, underground rivers flood the natural basins. Since many oases have a north-south orientation parallel to the Nile, some geologists suggest they were once tributaries of the mighty river. There is evidence that ancient Egyptians attempted to create some oases. Whoa. The Libyan oases are the best known, as they are geographically and culturally linked to the Nile Valley and the Delta. These western oases have a distinct geology from the other regions of Egypt. The most famous and important oases are Karga, Dakla, Farafra, Baharia, and Siwa. Whoa. The Spring of the Sun is one of many thermal sources in Siwa, with the particularity that Cleopatra would have bathed in this one, giving it its name. The presence of the source beneath was attested already by Herodotus during the 5th century BCE, when the oasis was called Amuneon by the Greeks of Cyrene. Whoa. Oracles predicted the future, delivered omens that could be more or less obscure, and offered divine guidance. The Siwan Oracle was considered one of the three greatest of the ancient world alongside the oracles of Delphi and Dodoni. Because of the Greek colonies in Cyrenaica, the temple associated Zeus with the worship of Amun. Whoa. It is no wonder that Alexander the Great made the perilous journey to Siwa in order to consult the oracle, emulating the actions of mythical heroes such as Hercules and Perseus. This action earned the approval of the oracle, who validated his claim as pharaoh of Egypt. He was confirmed as the son of Amun, conferring upon him the most legitimate claim to date of all Egypt's foreign invaders. The powerful and the rich would send gifts or travel great distances in order to ensure their good fortune by gaining the blessing of the oracle of Siwa. Every successful blessing only increased the soothsayer's prestige. Runner Eubotus, a famous citizen of Cyrene, consulted the oracle in order to know if he would win the 93rd Olympic Games race in 408 BCE. He did, enhancing the standing of the C1 oracle in the process. Whoa. The temple of the oracle of Amun was built in the 6th century BCE by Pharaoh Amasis. In the game, its entrance is guarded by ram-headed sphinxes, the animal representing Amun. They were inspired by similar statuary located at the British Museum. Another option would have a Greek-influenced representation of Zeus Amun, a human-headed sphinx with horns. This representation of Zeus Amun was very popular in Siwa. Welcome to the Fayum. The Fayum Oasis is an enormous basin in the western desert that formed from the Nile's overflow. As such, it is not considered a true oasis, though it gives its name to the region, which covers Lake Morris. The oasis harbors some of the oldest archaeological artifacts of the region indicating that the area has been inhabited by hunters and gatherers since the Neolithic period. The Fayum Oasis drains into Lake Morris, which was a large freshwater lake, but at some time became a saltwater lake. In the 12th dynasty, ancient Egyptians redirected the water flow with the dam, 
and dug a supply canal using the lake as their reservoir. Irrigation enabled them to continue growing crops of figs, grapes, and olives year-round. Reed boats, feluccas, triremes, and kerkeros were the most commonly found craft within the landlocked waters of Egypt. They were used for various purposes, ranging from daily fishing, trade, warfare, and travel, to the ferrying of massive stone blocks used to build the great monuments of Egypt. The most impressive pyramids of ancient Egypt date from the Old Kingdom and can be found on the sites of Giza, Saqqara, and Dashur. However, one particularly famous pyramid of the time is located elsewhere. During the Middle Kingdom, some pharaohs chose the Fayum as their final resting place. One such ruler was Amenemhat III. His pyramid left a mark on the imagination of antique chroniclers. They refer to it as the labyrinth, mostly due to the vast mortuary temple complex at the foot of the pyramid. Herodotus mentioned that he had visited 12 courts and over 3,000 of its chambers. But he was also well known for being prone to hyperbole. It was built with a brick core and covered with stone slabs designed to be impenetrable. The burial chamber, made out of a single block of sandstone, is unique in its design. Richard Lepsius and Flinders Petrie both explored the pyramid site, measuring 385 meters by 158 meters, and identified it as the location of the labyrinth. Their research conditions were difficult, as most of the site had been submerged by the nearby canal. Furthermore, the stones from the complex and the outer casing of the pyramid had been quarried away long ago. Ubisoft decided to give life back to this lost monument and the many crypts that were said to be devoted to the sacred crocodile god, Sobek. Founded during the 5th dynasty, the site was popular during the 12th dynasty under the name of Shedet. During the Ptolemaic era, the metropolis was named Crocodilopolis by the Greeks in honor of the crocodile god Sobek. During the Greco-Roman era, the Clerux, soldiers of the Ptolemies, settled there after their military service and expanded the irrigation systems. Irrigation and water distribution tripled the arable land and turned the city into a lush and rich area. 27,000 inhabitants lived in its precinct at its height. The city's location was strategic in controlling the many small waterways connecting to the main canal, and thus the Nile. The region's main cult was that of Sobek of Shedet, a divinity associated with water and fertility, both very important to an area that depended on irrigation. Many local villages had the title Town of Sobek added to their official designations. During festivals, ancient Egyptians recited hymns to Sobek, asking for his divine intervention. Greek settlers and later Romans would help the temple of Sobek's economy to flourish by adopting the local embalming mortuary rites, 
Their sarcophagi were beautifully painted and adorned with amazingly realistic portraits. Uh, whoa. Very similar to the cult of the Opus Bull in Memphis, a living crocodile was worshipped within the precinct of Crocodilopolis's main temple. Known as Sobek to the Egyptians and Sukos to the Greeks, it was reported by Strabo that priests fed it with meat, wine, and honeyed milk. They covered its body with jewels and gold. After its death, it was embalmed and placed within the crocodile's grotto, alongside thousands of other mummified crocodiles. Welcome to the city of Memphis. Throughout all ancient Egyptian periods, cities had one thing in common. They were situated along the Nile's shores. Cities were often designated for government or for worship. Major cities had several temples dedicated to numerous gods and goddesses. Egyptians referred to the organization of their cities as a sepat, or later on by the Persian term Nome. There were 20 sepat in Lower Egypt and 22 in Upper Egypt. The capital city of ancient Egypt changed many times over the periods. Whoa. One of the largest was Memphis, located in Lower Egypt. It was a key center for religious temples, including their most important deity, Ta, god of creation. Thebes, located in Upper Egypt, competed with Memphis and featured as both a political and a religious center. Two important temples, Luxor and Karnak, were built there. A minor capital of the Sayite dynasty was the city of Sais. This was the last native Egyptian capital of Egypt. Whoa. During the third dynasty, under Pharaoh Djoser, Memphis became the first religious and administrative capital of Egypt. Even when the political capital of Egypt decentralized itself, pharaohs were crowned in this sacred city in order to legitimize their ascension to the throne, up to and including Alexander the Great. Though little remains today save ruins south of Cairo, we can guess at the structure of the city, which stretched up to five kilometers in length and two kilometers in width. Memphis was also referred to as the city with the hundred doors or the white walls. These names were in reference to the wall which surrounded the city. Under the protection of Ta, god of craftsmen, the city was a thriving religious and economic hub. Whoa. Welcome to Artisans of Ancient Egypt. It was under the watchful eye of Ta of Memphis, the god of craft and architecture, that ancient Egyptians developed the unique rendition of the world they lived in. However, it is vital to understand that their view of art and those who created it was likely very dissimilar to the modern concept of the word. Instead of artists, the creative culture had skilled and respected artisans. The most significant categories of specialties for crafters were drawing, painting, sculpture, and metalworking. Ancient Egyptian craftspeople created both art and a wide variety of mundane, everyday tools. Every item created had a specific purpose and was produced by anonymous artisans who worked alone or with a team. Most crafts, such as pottery and metalworking, were utilized for everyday items. Luxury goods and artwork illustrations served temple rituals and were not meant for public display. Artisans rarely signed their names to the work, though they were clearly aware that they possessed a unique skill and talent for the task. 
Art, in all its forms, has offered not only a practical insight into the way ancient Egyptians lived, but in how they viewed the world and their place in it. The balance of order and chaos was crucial in both the physical and the metaphysical universes. As a result, their art appears to follow a strict set of stylistic conventions that supported this worldview. From households and palaces to temples and tombs, pottery, papyrus, and textile items were essential to the everyday life of ancient Egyptians. Whoa. In ancient Egyptian culture, drawing was used as illustration, such as seen in the Book of the Dead. It was also the first step in the creation of a relief, painting, or statue. Two-dimensional representations were concerned with order and form, and were intended to honor gods and promote the transition of the soul to the afterlife. Stylistically, Egyptians were concerned with the depiction of the human form's inner self. As such, artistic representations were not concerned with realism, but rather with idealized youth and perfectly harmonious visuals. An exception to this were scenes depicting hunting and battle, where the environment and enemies moved in lively, even chaotic ways. Animals and foes were depicted piled up, as if describing chaos with Egyptians standing in solemn, disciplined poses, bringing order to the scene. Reliefs could be either in high relief or low relief. Either method required a surface suited to the desired technique. Preparation of the surfaces differed depending on the quality of the rock. A quarried block only needed a simple smoothing. Rough cut rock monuments, such as those found in tombs, required more work. Often the surface was coated in plaster before being sculpted. For reliefs, preliminary sketches were drawn in red, then framed with a red grid to position the elements of the scenes. Corrected sketches were in black, and once approved, the scene was ready to be carved. This method likely explains the name given to relief makers, the one who draws the outlines. Statues were believed to be vessels for the souls of the deceased, or deities. That is why a sculptor was called the one who makes it live. This divine duty earned them the utmost respect. As with a relief, creation of a sculpture began with a drawing. Most statues were made of quarried blocks of stone, primarily limestone, though sometimes harder stones such as quartzite were also used. In ancient Egypt, the profession of crafter was organized and relied on a specific hierarchy. Most artisans depended on an institution to provide them with raw materials. There were three working levels for craftsmanship. At the domestic level, most Egyptians were craftspeople to a greater or lesser extent. The ability to repair tools was a daily necessity. Crafted everyday items could also be bartered for at the local market. Artisans with skills but lacking in resources worked at large estates, where the elite provided them with space to work and raw materials. The most skilled artisans were employed in royal or temple projects and benefited from a special status. They were provided with good workspaces and considered to be highly skilled. An ancient text known as the Satires of Trades has a number of descriptive summaries that offer teasing glimpses into how artisans were perceived. A coppersmith was said to stink and have fingers that resembled crocodile droppings, while potters were said to be like those who lived in bogs. This view was likely exaggerated in order to highlight the most enviable position of all, that of the scribe.
Located near the Valley of the Kings, Deir al Medina was a settlement created by Order of the King to honor the most skilled artisans. Its name translates as the Monastery of the City. Allocated a house on the initiative of the king, these craftsfolk were regarded with respect and referred to as the royal artisans. Those who lived there worked on the tombs in the Valley of the Kings and its surrounding temples. Archaeologists believe the site was home to skilled and respected artisans for over 400 years. It is considered one of the most important discoveries relating to Egyptian daily life. While much of the focus of Egyptian archaeology was on its kings and queens, it wasn't until the excavation of Deir al Medina that Egyptologists were given a valuable window into the community life of ancient Egyptian artisans. Mm. Welcome to Rediscovering Egypt. In the 19th century, the increased intensity of tourism and excavations, as well as the outflow of antiquities to other countries, threatened Egypt's archaeological heritage. Egyptians took part in this destruction by ransacking sites for artifacts to sell, quarrying stones from ancient monuments, and removing sebak, ancient mud bricks to reuse for their own purposes. A major step in conserving Egypt's heritage was taken in 1858, when the Viceroy of Egypt created the Antiquities Service. Supported by a team of foreign scholars, Auguste Mariette exerted an iron grip on the service. He carried out his work across Egypt and into Nubia intervening on almost every major site. Aware of the necessity of keeping unearthed artifacts in Egypt, Mariette requested a museum be created for that purpose in 1858. This museum was the ancestor of the Egyptian Museum. Gaston Maspero, Mariette's successor, expanded and reorganized the Antiquities Service and instigated laws regulating the export of artifacts. French scholars ran the service until it passed into Egyptian hands in the 1950s. As of the mid-19th century, Egyptology was fast becoming a recognized discipline within both private institutions and learned societies. A French architect, archaeologist, and former researcher, Jean-Claude Golvin, now specializes in the artistic reconstruction of ancient cities and monuments. To date, he has created more than 800 drawings, which include three volumes focusing on the reconstitution of ancient Egypt. His work is exquisitely detailed and can be found in books and museums around the world. The team was thrilled to collaborate with Jean-Claude Galvin in order to recreate Egypt for the game. In the 19 exclusive watercolors he created for the team, Galvin used scientific data as the base and then extrapolated to provide a full interpretation of various locations and monuments in ancient Egypt. Both early sketches and fully rendered images were then used by the team as references while building the world of Assassin's Creed origins. Whoa, whoa. Although ancient Egypt's rich religious culture and its mortuary monuments continue to be investigated, the modern discipline of Egyptology has shifted focus. Rather than single-mindedly retrieving impressive artifacts, Egyptologists today 
focus instead on increasing the body of knowledge. In the past, excavations took place in the field. And while that is still the case today, much of the work on Egyptology now takes place in libraries and archives. Today, archaeology in Egypt relies on an interdisciplinary approach where traditional Egyptologists are helped by a wide spectrum of scientists from other disciplines and new non-invasive techniques. GPS data, satellite imaging and ground penetrating radar allow archaeologists to gain a sense of what lies underneath the ground before excavating. Welcome to Natron. Natron is a colorless salt that was used by ancient Egyptians for food preservation, cleansing products, and glass making. It was also used in the mummification process. During the ceremonial embalmment ritual, the priests pack the body in natron in order to remove all of the moisture. Once the body was thoroughly desiccated, they could begin the wrapping. Natron was mined in Wadi Natron. The main mining methods involved either cutting slices out of the lake bed when it was dry, or raking through mineral saturated water to gather the mineral salts during the floods. Both techniques are still used today and inspired the team in their recreation of the mines located in the mountains northwest of Memphis. Welcome to Fauna of Ancient Egypt. Both domesticated and wild animals were features in ancient Egyptian bas-reliefs as early as the first dynasty. While the variety of wildlife served as a reliable food source, it also influenced both culture and mythology. Egypt's terrain allowed for a diverse range of animals, including panthers, rhinoceroses, elephants, and many variations of antelopes. Whoa. The Nile was home to many species of fish, along with hippopotami and crocodiles. The wide variety of birds that populated the riverbanks, from raptors and waterfowl to songbirds, were all catalogued within Egyptian hieroglyphic signs. Encounters with reptiles and insects, such as cobras, scorpions, and scarabs, influenced hieroglyphs and art. Whoa. While all animals had sacred meanings, lions in particular represented power and royalty to ancient Egyptians. They were so prized by pharaohs that they were hunted to extinction within Egypt. Welcome to Flora of Ancient Egypt. The climate and unique geography of the Nile Delta offered a wide variety of plant species. Many of these plants served as sustenance for ancient Egyptians and as crops for trade. The Nile's consistent seasons allowed Egypt to sustain itself for centuries. Whoa. Possibly the most useful of the plants was the papyrus, 
This tall sedge plant grew in abundance along the water's edge of the Nile. Commonly known for its use as paper, the ancient Egyptians found many other functions for it, including rope, sandals, and mats. Papyriform boats made from the plant are seen in paintings and reliefs, and were used in ritualistic ceremonies. There were many types of trees along the River Nile, such as the date palm, carob, and tamarisk. The earliest fruit tree cultivated was the fig tree, followed by apple, pomegranate, and eventually olive trees during the era of the New Kingdom. Mango cultivation was the result of a late import from Asia during the Middle Ages. Whoa. Some trees were associated with gods, such as the acacia with Horus. The divinities Thoth and Seshat were depicted inscribing the reign of the king into a Persia tree. The sycamore was connected with the goddess Iset, patron of the ritual of life. Welcome to Ancient Egyptian Hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphics were used as sacred writing, appearing on monuments, statues, and sacred papyrus texts. The earliest symbols that resemble hieroglyphs were on pottery dating back to 4000 BCE. This stylized form of signs and drawings was the only writing used from its ancient origins to the end of pharaonic history. Ancient Egyptians referred to hieroglyphs as the writing of the gods. Considered a difficult language, it was intended for pharaohs, nobility, and priests, and meant to be used in ceremonies, within tombs, and for government records. Since few Egyptians were able to read the ancient hieroglyphs, the mythological aura around the language was persistent, even in their own culture. The structure of hieroglyphs offers insight into Egyptian culture, not just in what the translations say, but in the structure of the symbols themselves. They were found on tomb walls, on sarcophagi, on statues, and on... In many temples, priests would perform rituals and daily offerings. These were accompanied by hieroglyphs used as spells. In tomb paintings, the hieroglyphs are represented with formulas to recite. These spoken words were meant to be spells which would allow the deceased to benefit from the offerings for all eternity. Spells and offerings were also written for the living to enhance medicines and cure illnesses. The most famous of ancient Egyptian documents is the Book of the Dead. Written in hieroglyphs and hieratic texts, it depicts important spells and rituals. These spells were intended to ensure a smooth transition from life to death and allow the deceased to safely navigate the perils of the afterlife. Even after it was deciphered, the reading of hieroglyphs remained difficult at times due to the many directions in which they can be read. Depending on the orientation of the signs, hieroglyphs can be read left to right, right to left, horizontally or vertically, though never bottom to top. <coughs> A clue on which way to read is to first notice which direction the figurative signs are facing. If a pictogram is looking to the right, then the reader is meant to start from the right and read towards the figure. Column text on a papyrus begins from the right, then goes top to bottom for each column. Text written on tomb walls resembles the structure of a page from a comic book. The text can be placed in front, behind, or above the character, and its symbols look in the same direction as the character. Another clue is that the name of a god or hieroglyphs meaning gods or kings 
are always written before the descriptive text. Compared to alphabetical languages, Egyptian hieroglyphs have more symbols. Confronted with the absence of vowels, the Egyptians invented a category of signs. When placed at the end of words, these signs help inform its meaning. For instance, a drawing of a lion will refer to a lion and also relate to the abstract concept of a lion as something dangerous or powerful. Middle Egyptian hieroglyphs contained a little more than 700 signs. By the end of the Greco-Roman period, there were 10,000 signs. Egyptologist Sir Alan Gardner created a list classifying common hieroglyphic signs and their variants. Ancient Egyptian languages have many similarities with Asian and African languages. They have evolved in similar ways to the various forms of written Egyptian. These languages belong to the Hamito-Semitic group. There were five clear evolutions in the Egyptian language, each with their own distinctive structure. These languages are known as Old Egyptian, Middle Egyptian, Late Egyptian, Demotic, and Coptic. Coptic is the only living language that allows linguists to define the vowel structure and to distinguish different dialects. While hieroglyphs and hieratic script give us an idea as to how the ancient Egyptian language was structured and written, the way it was spoken is still up for debate. The team opted for English as the spoken language, with the characters using ancient Egyptian and Greek words and accents. The language that is spoken in the background by the crowds is largely based on Sir Alan Gardner's Egyptian grammar. To help resurrect a dead language, we consulted Egyptologists and dialogue coaches to establish our target sound and cast actors with Arabic, Hebraic, and African backgrounds to bring the game to life. After Alexander the Great's arrival in Egypt and the establishment of his reign, Greek became a language used by the governing bodies. The inability to read hieroglyphs caused resentment among the Greek population. It's from this tension that the Rosetta Stone was created. The spread of Christianity ended pharaonic culture and resulted in the destruction of its pagan monuments. This also marked the end of hieroglyphic writing and understanding. Welcome to Jean-Francois Champollion. Between the 5th century CE and the Renaissance, knowledge of hieroglyphs was entirely lost. Many enthusiasts tackled the challenge of deciphering the language with little success. Some groundwork was made with various researchers identifying names and some grammatical structure, and confirming that cartouches were markers for royal names. They were still missing a critical piece of information that would... The Rosetta Stone was found in 1799 by Bouchard, a soldier in Napoleon's army. The stele dates from 196 BCE, written in ancient Egyptian and Greek with three scripts, hieroglyphics, demotic, and Greek alphabet. Following the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte in 1801, the English took possession of the stone. It has been at the British Museum since 1802, and remains the most visited object of the museum to date. The first translation was of the Greek section only in 1803. It detailed a decree of Pharaoh Ptolemy V, reminding the citizens that their Pharaoh had led Egypt to prosperity. It was fully translated 20 years after by Jean-Francois Champollion, who was working with a facsimile through his studies of the stone, Champollion was able to make a critical observation that would unlock the whole mystery. 
that hieroglyphics were not only ideograms, but also phonograms. Hieroglyphs consist of phonetic glyphs, single characters, and logograms. Essentially, they are a combination of phonetics, alphabet, and full words, which in total form a language. While studying the stone, Champollion realized that there was a difference in the number of hieroglyphic characters in relation to the number of Greek characters for the same word. This led him to believe that hieroglyphs must have phonetic characteristics. This was the first step to unlocking the Rosetta Stone's secrets. To prove this theory, Champollion began identifying Egyptian rulers' names and then compared their phonetic pronunciation to the Greek version. For example, Cheops had been the Greek name given by ancient chroniclers to the owner of the Great Pyramid, Khufu. The next step for Champollion was to confirm that his approach was verifiable by using the Philae obelisk as an additional reference. Engraved in the obelisk are two inscriptions in Egyptian hieroglyphs and Greek. Once he confirmed the names of Ptolemy and Cleopatra within these texts and confirmed the same phonetic patterns as on the Rosetta Stone, Champollion knew he was on the right track. Champollion had already mastered several ancient languages when he took on deciphering the Rosetta Stone he used his knowledge of Coptic to identify the solar disk hieroglyph on the obelisk as the phonetic translation of Ra. Further translation only strengthened his conclusion. Egyptian hieroglyphs encompass the alphabet in both phonetics and determinative ways, which means that the symbol represents the word itself. Welcome to Cyrene. Cyrenaica stretches across the coast of northwest Africa. It was known as Pentapolis in antiquity, a reference to the five main cities that formed the Greek colonies. Built on a lush plateau of the Green Mountains, in what is present-day Libya, a colony of Greek settlers formed the city of Cyrene, in 630 BCE. Cyrene's population quickly grew, spreading out across the terraces of the plateau, making it the first and largest of the five colonies. The city of Cyrene was founded by Batos Aristotle, guided by the Oracle of Delphi. Overcrowded and suffering from drought, Batos's home island of Thera could not sustain its citizens. Batos consulted the oracle, who told them to journey to the North African coast in search of arable land. A series of kings reigned over the city in the first two centuries. However, rebellion eventually ended the monarchy, and henceforth, the city was governed by the aristocracy. The key features of Cyrene were temples dedicated to gods, Apollo, Demeter, and Zeus, alongside Ptolemaic gods, such as Iset and Serapis. A large agora defined the city's center, and on the western edge, the famed Acropolis was built. A fortification wall was added around the harbor at the end of the second century CE. As the city grew, more buildings were constructed beyond the walls. Under Roman influence, Cyrene became an economic powerhouse, rising in status throughout the Mediterranean. Cyrene's school of medicine rivaled all others except for that of the Greek city, Kos. Some of the great minds in ancient math, astronomy, and geography were born or established in the various schools of the city, which included an institute of philosophy founded by Aristippus, a pupil of Socrates. 
From 115 to 117 CE, there was a revolt in the Jewish quarter that greatly damaged the city of Cyrene. Over time, a succession of battles, poor management of its silphium crop, and earthquakes eventually took their toll on the city. It was completely abandoned in 365 CE. The nearby port of Apollonia was an ideal location with its natural cove, sheltered by two islands and rocky inlets. Along with a lighthouse, the port was later equipped with keys and warehouses to accommodate the increased shipping traffic. With its success as a commercial trading port, Apollonia surpassed Cyrene to eventually become the capital of the Pentapolis. A number of earthquakes gradually shifted the city, causing many of its original structures to sink. Some of its ruins can still be seen underwater. Welcome to the Gladiator Arena. While gladiators would not perform in Cyrene until later in the Roman era, the team decided to include a gladiatorial arena for two reasons. First, they believed it was important to portray this aspect of Roman life. And second, they felt it would add interesting gameplay possibilities. The first gladiators to enter the arena were prisoners of war. It was a spectacle of violent clashes between men and against wild beasts that lasted nearly a thousand years. Eventually, volunteers began to enter the ring. For status and money, many of the more skilled combatants increased the quality of the entertainment. Thus, the profession of gladiator came to be. Bound by contract to the master of the gladiators, the fighters were fed, trained, and guarded in barracks. Gladiators were separated into heavy and light-armored fighters, each with their own set of specific armor and weapons. Organizers often had two audience-favored factions face each other in combat. The events were highly organized. Fights were held with a background of music and supervised by a referee. Death, either in the course of combat or by decision, was not always the only way out for the loser. Several were released due to their performance and gained great notoriety as celebrities. Welcome to the Agora and Thermal Baths. Cyrene's Agora was the public marketplace and political hub of the city. Its central courtyard was open to the sky, while market stalls and shops ran along the sides, some neatly tucked away under long-roofed colonnades. As in other Greek cities, the Agora included a central hearth, known as a Prytaneum. This place served as Cyrene's official embassy where guests were welcomed to the city. An unnamed statue representing naval victories was the centerpiece of the Agora. The statue's female figure likely represents Nike, the goddess of victory. It was likely very similar to the victory of Samothrace, which currently resides in the Louvre Museum and served as a reference for the team. Oh. 
The Cyrene Agora also displayed many temples and monuments celebrating its founding king, Batos, and the city gods. There were two altars associated with the Temple of Apollo and a marble statue base dedicated to the goddess Libya. The civic buildings included a law court complete with an archive library that would have housed legal documents and other papers essential to the city's governance. Traces of fire damage to the building's remains indicate that it was possibly destroyed during the rebellion of the Jewish community in 115 CE. Public baths were common in Roman and Greek cities, and Cyrene held true to this tradition. Two thermal baths from different eras were discovered among the ruins. An inscription at the entrance of one of the baths is presumed to be attributed to the owner. It dates the building to the Hellenistic period. Mosaics were originally created for practical reasons, the need to waterproof floors. Imported by Greeks in Egypt and Cyrenaica, the designs represented either scenes from daily life marine fauna, or mythological figures. In addition to traditional Greek motifs, they also integrated concepts specific to Egyptian culture, such as the Nalumbo. The best examples of mosaics recovered to date, however, come from Alexandria. The Cyrene baths were fitted into an underground tomb dated somewhere between the 8th and 6th century BCE. Bath seats were carved directly in the rock, allowing for more comfortable ablutions. As with many of the public buildings, the thermal baths were elaborately decorated. Sidi and Eros the Archer were discovered within. The Frigidarium, a pool of cold water, was the first room visitors entered. It was followed by the Tepidarium, or tepid water area, and then the hot water room called the caldarium. Water for the thermal baths was sourced from a natural spring. Burning stones were deposited into the water to create steam as required. The flowing water of the spring ended in a cistern and fountain referred to as the Aqua Augusta. Later Roman baths were built under Emperor Trajan and then restored under Hadrian. After the earthquake of 365 CE, they were replaced by baths of Byzantine design, with stones from the old thermal baths used in the reconstruction. The team relied on documentation describing the baths built under Trajan in order to create the location available in the game. Welcome to the Temple of Zeus in Cyrene. Facing east towards the rising sun stands the temple dedicated to the cult of Zeus. It was built sometime in the 5th century BCE. 70 meters long with 46 Doric-style columns, the imposing structure was the largest Greek temple erected in Africa. It was only slightly larger than the Parthenon and the Temple of Zeus in Olympia. The exterior was designed with the decorative elements common to Doric architecture. The dimensions of the columns were different, giving visitors an impression of uniqueness when viewing each facade. After the temple was destroyed during the Jewish rebellion, Emperor Hadrian had it reconstructed. He chose not to rebuild the outer portico, but did restore the new Corinthian columns in marble. The temple was later completed under Marcus Aurelius. In the time of Augustus, a faithful but smaller imitation of the Olympian Zeus was used to be worshipped. 
Hadrian then installed a new 12-meter-high statue matching the Zeus in Olympia. It was made of chiseled marble with the head, arms, and feet carved in the round. Archaeologists confirm that there was a monumental statue of Zeus in this temple, though experts remain divided on whether it was one of Zeus or one more specific to the cult of Zeus Ammon. The team elected to place a statue of Zeus Ammon in this location, knowing that Cyrene was central to the spread of this cult in the Greek Mediterranean area. Welcome to Important Monuments of Cyrene. The Sanctuary of Apollo sits on a prominent edge of the plateau of Cyrene, overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. It could be accessed either by the road from Apollonia, via the necropolis, or by the Sacred Way, coming from the agora of the city. <laughs> The abundance of temples and statues throughout the city reflect the various Greco-Roman and Egyptian cult influences over the centuries. Temples dedicated to Apollo, Cyrene, and Zeus stood alongside those of Ptolemaic gods, such as Serapis and Iset. Numerous fountains were decorated to represent other gods, including the city's namesake, Cyrene. <laughs> A vestibule known as a propyleum marked its entrance and highlighted the fountain of Apollo. God of the sun and of protection, Apollo was an important deity to both Greeks and Romans. The sanctuary built in his honor was considered to be sacred. <laughs> The imposing temple was built on a natural cornice, stretching more than 200 meters in length and roughly 50 meters in width, and was surrounded by a vast Doric colonnade. Sections uncovered by archaeologists indicate restorations to the columns were made between 115 and 116 CE. The altar was located in front of the temple, both are estimated to be the same age, though restored at different times. Many bulls were sacrificed each year at the altar in honor of Apollo. The imprint in the stone of the ring used to strap the animals down is visible to this day. Carved during the Roman era, the Apollo Cytherid was discovered near the temple. It is considered an important archaeological find. The statue of Apollo was in pieces when it was uncovered. Remarkably, most fragments were found, and the restored statue is currently at the British Museum. The team extrapolated the statue's final look based on the current partial reconstruction and placed it inside the temple to reflect the patron deity of the area. The amphitheater of Cyrene is located on what is known as the Terrace of Myrtosa, next to the Sanctuary of Apollo. It was built on top of the old theater in the second century. Originally used as a stage, the theater became an amphitheater once the taste for Roman gladiatorial entertainment reached the city. Entrances were placed at both ends of the amphitheater. A wall replaced the first two rows of bleachers as protection from the array of wild animals in the ring. The tunnel used for the parade of beasts and gladiators circled the arena, unlike the Roman Colosseum's tunnel, which was beneath the amphitheater. The basement and corridors accommodated both the gladiators and the animals and included lifts that raised the traps into the arena's center. Since the original theater was close to the cliffside, the expansion didn't allow for a perfect circle, 
Instead, junctions of the semicircle form the arena into an oval shape. This elliptical formation still ensured an excellent view from all angles. The team decided to create a perfectly round theater for technical reasons and use the structure of the Roman theater as their reference. Welcome to the Acropolis of Cyrene. Located on the western edge of the city, Cyrene's Acropolis was smaller than the one in Athens, though its high vantage point provided protection for the city. At its entrance was a single door, flanked by two towers. An inscription, legible to this day, states that the walls and the citadel were restored in the time of Augustus. A number of statuettes have been excavated from the site, including one of Berenice, the daughter of Magus, the king of Cyrene, and half-brother of Ptolemy II. At the northeast tower, there is a sanctuary consisting of two small temples with a vestibule and an altar believed to be that of Serapis and Iset. When the temples were excavated, archaeologists found traces of fire damage. However, there are no indications as to when this fire occurred. In the 20th century, a fortification was built above the ward to defend against an invading army. It covered the ancient remains of nearby Roman houses entirely, and archaeologists have yet to fully excavate them. Welcome to Major Exports of Cyrene. Cyrene's main source of economic wealth was in the cultivation and export of poppies and silphium. Though the opium oil from the poppies was also an export, little is known about this crop. Information about the cultivation of silphium, however, is more accessible to us. Silphium, with its yellow flower, was considered a gift from the sun god. Grown solely in this region near the Mediterranean Sea, silphium extract was exported at high prices and was so crucial to the wealth of Cyrenaica that it was depicted on their coins. Silphium's roots produced a resin used by both the Greeks and Romans in medicines intended to cure cough, fever, indigestion, and many other ailments. It was also used as a contraceptive. In a compilation of culinary recipes from the 4th century BCE, the herb is mentioned in various recipes, including a flamingo dish. High demand, over-exploitation, and possibly a shift in climate all contributed to the eventual extinction of silphium. The last mention of it dates from the 4th century CE, and to this day, no traces of this plant have been identified. Mm -hmm. 